morning, church. God bless you all. I've got a water bottle on the table down there. Hey, it's great to see you. And uh, everybody looks a little bit more tan now than they did a few weeks ago, which is nice. And I hope you've been having a great holiday and some rest and some family fun and food and all of those sorts of things that go on around Christmas and holiday times. And uh, let's stand together. We're going to have a great time this morning. We're going to push into the presence of the Lord. We're going to allow, <coughs> allow the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us into our lives. We're going to have a, have a fantastic time with the Lord. I feel like I need to uh, crank you all back up and get you back in the flow <coughs> and uh, get, you, get you really fired up for this uh, 2024. We need, to, we need to be going full on in 2024. There's lots of prophetic changes taking place. Uh, in the nation and in the nations that are going to require us to really step up, I think, for a new, another level, a new level next year or this year. Isn't it? It is 24, isn't it? Already, help us. It's all right. Short-term memory shot, but I can remember what I did when I was three years old pretty well. But uh, all right. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your incredible presence here with us. And Lord, we love meeting together, but even more than that, we love meeting with you. And Father, we, um, we just value this time so much, Lord, coming into the house of God and being with you, being with each other. And Holy Spirit, we give you liberty and freedom in this place and freedom in our lives. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would talk to us, change us, challenge us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd bring revelation to each and every one in your house and those who tune in this week that you, they would receive revelation from you, Lord, something that would shift them in the realm of the Spirit. And we pray all of this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right.
sanctuary. We give you glory, we give you glory. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, have your way this morning. We're hungry for you, Lord. We're hungry for you.
Halleluja. Sometimes I fall to my knees in prayer. Come, Jesus, come. Let today be the day. Sometimes I feel like I'm gone.
So come, Jesus, come. Yes. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. There's no one like you, Lord. There's no one like you, Lord. Come on, let's just turn our hearts towards the Lord this morning. We love you, Jesus. You are worthy of it all, worthy of all praise and all honor. Come on, just begin to worship the Lord in your heart. Lift up your hands. Say
Hallelujah. Give him glory. Give him praise. Lift them up. Lift up the Lord. Oh, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, Lord. We magnify your awesome, awesome name. We exalt you. We exalt you. We exalt you. We exalt you, Lord. We lift you up. Oh, let the angels sing. Let the heavens open, Lord. Oh, let the heavens open, Lord. Let your glory come, Lord. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we just give you glory. We give you praise. Keep it going there. Don't die on me. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. Give him a blessing. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, and another one, and another one, and another one. Hallelujah. Lord. Yeah, Father, we just thank you so much for your wonderful presence and for your glorious presence, Lord. And we love you, we magnify you, we lift you up today. King of kings, Lord of lords, we exalt you, we exalt you, we exalt you, we exalt you. The Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, over all, sovereign, reigning in power and glory. We give You honour, we bow before You, we bow our hearts before You, mighty God. Holy Spirit, we ask, we ask not only for this morning, Holy Spirit, we ask Holy Spirit for this year. Lead us, Holy Spirit, guide us, Holy Spirit, help us, Holy Spirit, bring revelation, Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray, Holy Spirit. We want to honour You, Holy Spirit. We want to give You liberty. We want to give You freedom in our lives, in our families, in this place, Lord. Oh, let, lead us, Holy Spirit. Lead us into Your glory, into Your presence, into Your richness, into Your goodness, Lord. And we'll be sure to give You all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' mighty Name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Awesome. Hey, we'll have the ushers come. Let's uh, give the Lord our tithes and offerings. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I think what happened there, Jack, at the end of the music, the fallback, there was no music. Everything just went. <laughs> we don't like. <laughs> we like. Father, we just honour You and we thank You for the privilege of being able to sow, to give, to tithe and to um, just uh, allow this part of the covenant to function fully in our lives. We know, Lord, that You are our source, You're our supply and You're our provision. We thank You for that in Your mighty Name. Amen. Thank You, ushers. Praise God. And we've got a few exciting things happening around the place and one of the things I'm looking forward to is the cafe opening next Sunday morning. <laughs> Tell you what, I've been suffering deeply without my scone and coffee. <laughs> it's all right, you're not tuning into that, are you? But that's all right. <laughs> uh, things, are, things are coming together really good for uh, conference coming up. That's uh, our next biggest event. And um, well, before that actually is the Easter camp, 412 Easter camp. That's going to be mammoth. It's going to be really awesome this year. And then that rolls straight over into conference and quite encouraging, I was telling Nancy, because um, for the first time we have John Alley and his wife Hazel are coming over to minister um, as part of our conference. And um, kind of an interesting story because when the move of the Holy Spirit hit Nancy and I way back in the early 90s, we're doing a lot of traveling and John and his wife, um, I think they had a Salvation Army background actually, but they were spirit filled people leading a Baptist church in Rockhampton, Australia, and they were wanting to bring the move of the Holy Spirit into the church, and somehow or other we were recommended to come and minister, and I remember it quite vividly because I wasn't quite sure if the church was really ready for what took place, and, um, but anyway, um, it, it was a good time, and um, over the years, John has really emerged as probably one of the foremost teachers around the area of the apostolic ministry. 
and uh, just has a lot of written, a lot of books and, and great guy. But anyway, talking to him about conference, I can probably get rid of this one now. Oh, the other one is on. It's, it's uh, the sound man. <laughs> and um, so anyway, um, uh, I'd contact him in because I know that all these guys are busy and I said, look, I know that you're busy and, and um, you know, if you can come over the conference at this period. And he wrote back and he said, oh, I've got a rumbling. It might be Basie in the fallbacks going on. Something's bunging around here. <laughs> it's one of those mornings. I've had a week. I've had a whole week of it. I'm going to share my struggles with you. <laughs> anyway, um, John contacted me and he said, oh, he said, I oh, know we'd really love to come to the whole thing. And uh, we want to come to the pastor's dinner on Tuesday night and every, everything that's going on. But I was just really blessed by that, that, you know, that often ministries come and go and they're busy rushing in, but the, um, people that want to make an investment in relationship and in the church, it's a blessing. And um, caught up with Brother Seth and uh, he's coming back in as well. And I've still got this thing going on here. I think it might be the fills and it's Basie and Rumbly. Ah, it's getting a little bit better already. And uh, yeah, so Seth's going to be coming in as well, and he has his conference um, over the Easter weekend. It goes on, he's got visiting speakers, and, and uh, he's going to be with us for a few days. And I'm still waiting for final from Don Mack, but um, I think we're going to have a fabulous conference this year. It's going to be really, really great. So um, I'm looking forward to that. The, um, uh, the great prayer meeting out there on Friday night, the 412 had a prayer meeting out at the campsite. And uh, Neil and Jeff and I had been out there making hay while the sun shines. And then all of these cars arrived and all these people started flooding in. And um, that was fantastic. And um, I believe there's going to be a woman's uh, prayer meeting out there on Wednesday night, the 17th of January at 6.30. And um, there's something about the campsite at the moment. There's uh, the Spirit of the Lord's out there. And uh, he'll be waiting for you. So when you get organised and get in your cars and get out there on the 17th, you're going to get really blessed. And uh, it's, ex- it's exciting what's, what's, uh, what's taking place around the place. Um, the, let's see, see what I had here. A couple of other things. We got that done. We got that done. I think um, Kids Church and everything reopened. That's the 28th. Is that next week, the 28th of January? Is January gone already? No. Two weeks. All right, oh, so the, um, the cafe's going to open early, though. It said here the 28th, but nah. Can't wait, can't wait that long. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Deb. The, um, yeah, so uh, it's been an interesting week, and it's still echoey all around the place out there, Jack. I don't know what's going on here, but um, something's going on. And um, been making hay all week, so uh, Sunday after church last week, I headed out and we started cutting hay and getting things going out there and it's been really it's been quite an interesting week because um, I've had two tractors breaking down two um, balers broke down uh, a uh, mower half exploded um, it's been a really interesting week then yesterday yesterday after we'd repaired the, the um, baler one time we um, we it broke again we had to get it repaired urgently lucky I live next door to an engineer and I went to get into my car to take the parts in and the car had a flat tire not only that the washing machine had broken down that morning so the Lord is on the throne <laughs> just as interesting because there's a lot of just a lot of a lot of activity I think some of the stuff is natural and some of it is supernatural some of it's definitely spiritual and um, I think things are firing up um, for this year. So this, I just felt this week being out on the farm and that was really good and, and just I really enjoy those times. I love it. And uh, that's my holiday is, is out there making hay. And um, uh, it's a lot of things because um, out there we've, had, we've got apricot trees out at the campsite. There's about four of them in a row. And we've owned the campsite for about 20 years and they probably the amount of fruit you could count on it usually is like your hands and fingers and your toes you know but um, this year it's just overflowing with fruit absolutely abundant overflowing with fruit and um, you know it's falling on the ground and I was looking at that and I felt that because this year is the year of the harvest and 
I felt the Lord just spoke, spoke to me out of that and he said, well, what do you expect when it's harvest time? You know, what, where was your expectation? And I thought the, the natural sign was also a spiritual sign for this year, the coming harvest this year. It's going to be exciting. The other thing is that the hay, uh, this year we're getting so much hay out of the paddocks, it's almost like a third more than our, than our normal uh, quota. And that's harvest as well. I love the, the, the hay is interesting because it's not harvesting food for humanity directly, it's, it's preparation for all the animals, it's looking after the animals, it's making sure during the winter months that they're going to be well fed and well taken care of. You know that I've got a few things going on in my life at the moment, you know that I've been addressing some of the food issues going around and people are struggling with that, hallelujah. And, um, and then I'm, I'm talking about um, some of the creation, like the Lord this week was talking to me about, um, about the harvest and about the farming and about things like that. And, and, um, and then yesterday I thought he just spoke to me and he said, you know, in times gone by, the people ate the food that was in season. Um, nowadays, you know, we fly food in from all over the world. We eat what we want whenever we want because we just fly it in. It's a, you know, a global society. But in the old days, you know, now, now would be the time of the year everybody would be eating the fruit because it's ripe. Um, in the winter time, you'd have your stored foods like your onions, your garlic, your kumara, your potatoes, your pumpkins. Um, in the old days, they would have uh, cured the meat, you know, salted the meats down, um, dried them into jerky. Uh, if you've ever been to, to Alaska, they do salmon jerky and they marinate it in, um, in that sauce that comes from Canada. What's the famous maple syrup? And it's to die for. It's absolutely to die for, I tell you. And I was staying with, um, with our friends up there one time and he had this jar and he said, oh, you might want to try that. And I couldn't stop eating it, you know, for days anyway. It wasn't just one jar, but um, yeah, and I just thought about, because I think, I think that um, uh, Nancy said to me this morning that something I'd been thinking about, it's interesting when somebody else says what you've been thinking about, it's like a confirmation. And she was talking to me, um, she just said this morning, she said, oh, the... The fathers of, of the faith are now to prepare the next generation for the coming of the Lord. And I, I do feel an urgency, I don't know about you, but everything's changed in our world in the last few years and the change is continuing. Um, I don't know how to explain it, I just know it in my spirit, I feel it in my spirit. And I do feel that there's a real urgency to prepare you and to prepare the next generation for the coming of the Lord. I'm not saying he's coming next week or the week after, but there's, there's an urgency now for the harvest to come in and there's an urgency now. And I, I thought, the, um, I'm just throwing out um, what I call daily bread, you know, the stuff that the Lord's been giving me in the last couple of days. And um, it's interesting that they talk, the Bible talks about the fathers of the faith. It actually said there's not many fathers. And I felt the Lord spoke to me prophetically and he said, the, the trouble is around the churches these days, you've got fathers of everything, but not many fathers of the faith. So what does a father of the faith do? A father of the faith raises his children with a godly, they give them a godly inheritance. What does a father in the faith do in the greater body? Because we are a family. We're not, you know, the selfishness is our li own little family that we're looking after, but we're the family of God. And what does the fathers of the faith do in the church? They lead everybody towards the Lord. They lead them towards faith in God. And then, um, then there's a lot of fathers in the world that are not, le they're not fathers of the faith. So they'll lead you to the golf course, they'll lead you out here fishing, they'll lead you there, they'll lead you there, they'll lead you somewhere else. But all of those things, all of those things are the natural thing. They're not wrong things, they're all natural things. Uh, Nancy and I were talking too, We'd, I don't know how we both ended up on the same subject, but I'm still studying the millennial reign of Jesus Christ and looking at some of those things and some of the end time things. And um, I was reading about, um, you know, as it was in the days of Noah, you know, they were marrying and giving and marrying. They were building, they were planting, they were doing all of these things. And um, I read all of the lists and I thought, oh, none of those things are actually wrong. Um, they're all good things we have to do. You build houses, you plant food, you, you work, your family, all those things. But when it gets out of focus, when those things become, uh, they override our faith in God, when they become subservient to our relationship with God, um, then, then that's when the problems. Of course, he talked about not only the, the times of uh, Noah, he talked about the times of Lot 
And now that's a whole different story because when you read about the story of Lot, um, humanity then had got into very deep sexual perversion. And uh, you'll remember the story in there that when the angels came in and Lot welcomed them in the house, it says in the Bible, which is, this is the thing, it, it talked about the lust of the men. It's talked about every man in Sodom wanted to have sex with these angels. They wanted to rape them. They wanted to, isn't that, that's interesting. I think there's gonna be things that we see in the, in the times as we go towards the coming of the Lord, there's gonna be a lot of perversion. There's gonna be a lot of sexual perversion. People are gonna get caught up with, with um, what we might call materialism, the day-to-day -day life, which has consumed them. And then there's gonna be the dark side. Uh, Nancy and I talk quite a bit, and Nancy particularly, I share all of her messages really. Um, I, get, I have two sources of revelation, God and Nancy. And, um, but we've been talking since the Palestinian uprising and what happened um, over there in Israel and that horrendous course of events. And, but um, when you look at it, it's really interesting because uh, Nancy had said to me a couple of times, said it's interesting that they went over uh, the terrorists, they were terrorists and they went over um, into the rock concert where the young people, they went over to take out the young people. Now we know they took hostages of children and older adults as well, but the primary attack was on the young people because if you understand what's happening, God is doing something amongst the young. The Spirit of God is moving amongst our young people, our children, 412, youth, young adults. There is something supernatural actually going on and the attack come. Then the other thing we talked about is um, with ISIS and, and the, the Islamic terrorists, terrorists and a different one, they do something else that's interesting. They commit their atrocities, they love to murder, but they murder on, they film it. They film it and then they post it. And then they celebrate the bloodlust and the murder over and over again. They murder, they post, and then they celebrate it over and over again. And also, also they're speaking to the world. They, they're trying to, it's trying to bring fear and intimidation on the world. This is what you will do to you if you don't agree with us. This is what we'll do to you. But I thought, I thought about, um, I, you know, um, there's a whole broader thing going on now. The Lord spoke to me about revelation this week so, so clearly. And he said to me, Murray, when you disobey, when you won't respond and obey revelation, you stop getting revelation. And I was talking, I said to the Lord, I said, oh, is that why there's a lot of immature Christians in the church? And I felt the Lord says yes, because people, see people, there's some people they just want to keep learning and never changing. They just want information. You know, let's go and sign up for another course and read 10 more books and listen to 40 tapes because you're getting information. But the trouble with information is it just fills you up and puffs you up and you can have great debates with people because you know so much. But the thing about revelation, it's very, very different the way revelation works. Revelation demands change. It demands a response. And when you, when you won't respond to revelation, you stop getting it. And then what happens in the body of Christ is people stagnate and they could be around 20 or 30 years and they're not really growing and developing. And one of the things you need to understand is if you obey revelation and respond to it, God gives you more. So what actually happens in your life? You have this life of constant change, constant revelation, and you're constantly being formed into the image of Christ Jesus. There's this work of God that begins to go on in your life and, and it's a life-changing work of God. I, I just felt to listen to a Derek Prince tape and I said to Nancy, I was quite encouraged that but actually by Derek Prince because when he was preaching, he said, he said, I've been a Christian for 50 years. And, um, and he says, you know, I've learned some things over the years. And he, he, was, he was just talking and I, I related because I've been a Christian 49 years uh, in a couple of weeks. And I thought, oh, isn't it, inter isn't it good to be a Christian for 49 or 50 years? What a, what a uh, wonderful, wonderful life that we've had. But the thing is, when he started talking, I thought, yes, yeah, see, he's saying things that I'm thinking now in where I'm at in my spiritual walk and my spiritual life. And, and see, you get guys like Derek Prince and say, how come he, he had preached on so many things? He had so much revelation because he was obedient. And in this message, when he's a Christian, 50 years old, I'll try and think because he gave a testimony. Oh, it was about alcohol. And he said that he, biblically, he believes that um, the scripture doesn't ban alcohol. 
and, and the consumption of alcohol. And this, was, this is Derek Prince's testimony. He said, and he believes, and, and um, we might differ a bit, but he believes the Lord probably drank wine. And he said, you know, to Timothy, have a glass of wine. And he said he, he had drunk wine um, all the way through his Christian life. So this is, he's now 50, and he said the 50 years as a Christian, he said, last year the Lord spoke to him, he was with his wife, he went out to a, uh, uh, they were staying in a hotel, they had a dinner, he said he believed he had three glasses of wine with the dinner, he said he wasn't drunk or anything like that, they just went up, they went to bed, and he said he woke up feeling absolutely terrible, and he said the, there was a demonic entity saying to him, and I'll get the thing, the right one was uh, not, was it like heart attack, something like that. Anyway, I've got the wrong thing there, but you'll get the gist of the message. And he said he, said he, ha he has a foundation in spiritual warfare. And, and um, so he started, we'll call it heart attack. He started rebuking the heart attack. He said, no, I'm not receiving that. I'm not having that. I'm not having that monster. Then he said his, his head started throbbing. He said he got up out of bed to go to the bathroom and he, he said he stumbled and he, he had to lean against the wall to get, to get to the bathroom. And then he said he sat down and he said to the Lord, he just started talking, he said, God, what's, what's going on? What's happened? And he said the Lord just pointed out the alcohol to him. And then he said, he said I'm, not saying that, I'm not legalistic about it, he's not saying anything like that, but he said that night I stopped and I haven't touched it since. And see, but you know, you because I tell you what, what actually happens is it's it's no longer a, when you are mature in the Lord, it's no longer about right or wrong. It's about what's anointed and what's not. It's about carrying the presence of God, and carrying the presence of God. We should be dealing with sin earlier in our life. You know, that's baby stuff dealing with sin, right or wrong, disobeying the God. But what actually happens is you get to the point where the revelation is. Is what I'm doing, is the way I'm living, is the way I'm acting, is the way I'm responding, does that, is that bringing God's blessing on my life or is it pushing God's blessing away from my life? Am I moving outside of the blessing? And then he went on, Derek Prince went on, he, there's a few things that he said and I loved it because he was an itinerant ministry by this time, not pastoring a church, leading a church. And um, he said that the Lord had clearly spoken to him and he said, and, and I love this because this, I, I just love it. He said, the Lord had spoken to him and said, unless the fruit, the spiritual fruit is planted in the house of the Lord, it'll never flourish. And of course, there's a psalm that says that those who are plant, planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. And he said that one of the dangers of itinerant ministry is that you can draw people in a crowd, you can draw people to yourself, but if they don't get planted in the vineyard, in the, in the house of the Lord, if they don't get planted, he said, they'll never grow, they'll never bear fruit, and they'll never flourish. And, um, and I mean, I'm, it's, it's, it's always good when, when the people are saying the things that you like anyway, that you want to hear, you know, and I've always loved the church. I love the church. Um, I, I, I love being in the church. I, I'd, I'd feel like someone, if I... When I'm not able to get into church, I feel like someone's chopped my right arm off. I love, I love the house of God because I love the bride. I love the bride of Christ. The church is the bride. It's beautiful. It's amazing. God is doing something wonderful with us, uh, the bride of Christ. But this area of revelation and what actually happens is, um, also I was going to say um, um, with the fathers of the faith and the revelation, have a, Look where people are leading you. When people come around your life, are they leading you towards the things of the Lord? See, the reason there's going to be a revival amongst the young adults and the youth is because the young adults and the youth are planning and seeking God and intimacy with God and spiritual activities. I mean, they, I, we, I threw Nancy or someone the other day and, and they're talking now about possibly doing a 40-day uh, fast in preparation for conference. And all some other people have been thinking about is driving around the nation and swimming. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring a contrast to you because a lot of people, you wonder why things are not really firing for you spiritually is because your focus is wrong. You've, you're just focused on carnal, ordinary life issues and, and, and you really, see, what happens is, um, the church doesn't exist to provide you social activities. 
the church exists to to provide you spiritual, supernatural spiritual encounters and wisdom, and wisdom in the things of God. And see, I feel like um, it's interesting, it says in the Bible that there's lots of teachers but not many fathers. And I think think that the, the difference there is a teacher can come and go, it's like going to university. They turn up, they teach their thing, they go on, they're not concerned about the people. The father is concerned about the people. I, I know I'll challenge you on a lot of things. I'd love to be able to say what I really think sometimes. I, at times the Lord has me in restraint because I'd love to confront a lot of the issues that I see going on in lives that are spoiling your lives. You, you're literally missing out. You're missing out on the, on the greatness and the revelation and the blessing and the glory and the miraculous presence of God in your life because you're carnally minded and you're focusing on a thing. I'd love to slap you. I'd love to line you up and give you all a hiding and realign. Re- yeah. But not because I'm a legalist, not because I'm legalistic, but because the heart of the Father wants, we, I want you to prosper in God, to really prosper in God. Not a half-hearted thing. I want you to really prosper in God. I want, you to, I want you to know, I want you to know him. I want you to know what it is to know that he's your life, he's your breath, he's your existence. Without him, you have nothing. You have nothing. You see, the trouble with this world that we live in today, this world is right in our faces and it's demanding our time, our attention, our finances. People will, for like stuff like, I, I'll, I'll whack this one because I felt like, yeah, I'm whacking things this morning. No, it's 2024, let's whack a few things. The, <laughs> The Lord spoke to me about people with sport. They'll go to any end. They'll drive across the nations. They'll put an investment of incredible amounts of money. They'll spend thousands of dollars on a set of golf clubs and you couldn't get them to sign up to a Bible college for a week. It was going to cost them a hundred bucks. It's all upside down. It's all upside down. This is truth. I'm giving you truth. Some people, you know, the, the thing, your passion is not God. You, you know, you think because you turn up to church every now and again or, you know, you might be pretty regular, you put a little bit of money in, you don't tithe faith, you put a little bit of money in the offering. You think it's all going to be good and it's all going to work. No, 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 you're just ripping yourself off. You're literally ripping yourself off in the things of God. I was um, <clears throat> going out because, um, you know, you've got to make hay while the sun shines. And, and, uh, but I thought, you know, like this week, it was, I knew it was going to be a physically busy week and late nights working and that sort of stuff. But I thought, no, no, I'm not gonna break, I'm not gonna break my cycle. I still want God first. So I just got up earlier in the morning and went in and sat in the presence of God and listened, listened to some tapes and read and studied the word. Because see, <clears throat> what, I'm, what I'm realizing now is um, Nancy and I on the way in in the car, we were talking about the 10 virgins and it's really interesting because they were all in the church. <laughs> they all had oil didn't they? They all had oil. They were all waiting for the bridegroom, right? They were all dressed up, all ready to go to the wedding feast of the Lamb. They weren't, five of them were not non-Christians and five of them Christians. They were all Christians. But you know what the problem was? There was five of them that didn't have enough. And you know what they didn't have enough of? They didn't have enough of the anointing. They hadn't built into the anointing. They didn't have enough of the presence of God to sustain them until the bridegroom arrived. And I, I, I think sometimes in the church, uh, the church doesn't have enough of the presence of God to sustain you until the bridegroom arrives. And you'd have to be deaf, dumb and blind, worshipping idols, not to see that the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is closer. There's something happening. I'm not doing that as a way of scare. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not interested in a fear-based gospel or anything like that. I'm interested in a faith-based gospel. But if you understand anything about the end times, what the Lord says over and over again, you be watching, watching. You watch and you wait. You be ready. You be ready. The message is this. You've got to be ready every single day of your life because you don't know what day he's coming. Nobody knows. And if you ever see a book or anything like that and somebody says, oh, he's going to come on the 21st of May or something like that, you know that that's just the devil and it's deception because the only one that knows when he's coming is the Father. The Son doesn't even know. Only the Father knows. That's what the Scripture tells us. And so we've got to understand that. But see, the message of the Scripture is be ready. You've got to be, you've got to be perpetually ready. 
And I think, I think readiness, I think readiness is carrying the presence of God. It's having the anointing of God on your life. I, th- I, think, I think people that are unready is like those five virgins that turned up. They didn't have enough oil on their lives to make it through. They were in the church, for goodness sake. They were in the church, but they didn't have enough. I mean, I suppose uh, one of the good things I read, I was reading end time scripture the other day and I read the scripture and it talked about the millennial reign and I'll probably misquote this a little bit, but um, what, it actually, what it actually says specifically is that when Christ returns a millennial reign, we will have no memory of everything that preceded. And I'm thinking, thank God for that. Otherwise, all I'd be doing in, in the millennial reign is weeping over all the people that never made it. <laughs> Especially if you're called to ministry and your whole life is around preparation of people to meet the king and to serve the king fruitfully and faithfully. If you, if you got there and looked around and half of the church were not there, you'd spend the rest of your eternity weeping over how did, how did we miss it? What did we do wrong? How did we miss out? You know, what, what has happened to us? And so Christianity is not religion. It's not bowling up the church every now and again and putting a few bob in the plate. And it's not, it's not um, you know, having a lifestyle that's a little bit more positive for your teenagers to be around other teenage kids that go to church. It's, that's religion. It's an enemy. It's an enemy of the Lord. It's an enemy of the church. And um, I, uh, yeah, so... That's what I've been thinking about this week. I'm, I'll be you're so pleased that I share with my thoughts with you. Yeah. And you also should be pleased that there are some thoughts I'm not sharing with you. Because I'm not, you know, some of the things that I know, <laughs> we know, when you're with God, you know a lot of things. By revelation, you know stuff. And um, oh, the Lord's going to give me liberty to talk about some of those things anyway. I'm going to quote Derek Prince. I wrote this down because I just, I just thought some of the things he said. He, he was talking about the spirit of lawlessness and that's one of the attributes of the last days. Um, you know, what happens in the last days, the spirit of lawlessness. And he said this, the spirit of lawlessness is just doing your own thing. It's answering to nobody, being accountable to no one, to go your own way, live your life as you please, regardless of what others do or think. Isn't that interesting? That, that's, what he, that's how he defined the spirit of lawlessness. And um, see, I can, we can, you can gauge the temperature of someone's passion for God just the way they treat the house of the Lord. Once a month, well, you, 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 your wick's nearly gone out. Oh, it's the petrol. You, you got the petrol to do all the other stuff. It's, it's a problem. You've got a problem. You've got a passion problem. Um, the other thing is too, um, I'm a non-conformist, so um, anybody who's a non-conformist will be able to um, probably relate to me a little bit. I'm a non-conformist. But I want to tell you, when a non-conformist gets saved, he doesn't conform any longer to the world. He's not resisting the church. He's not resisting the Lord. He's living... Non-conformists in the body of Christ live a radical life for Christ and they do not conform to the spirit of the world. Um, I really believe in God that there's a lot of people here this morning, you need to reprioritize your life. Some of you just need to stop doing some of the stuff that you're actually doing. Hmm. Psalm 92, 13, it is, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit in old age. They shall be f- fresh and flourishing, like me, fresh and flourishing. <laughs> it's kind of interesting because I'm jumping around a little bit, but I know you, you're following me. You've been here before. Daniel, Daniel 5, it's really interesting. Verse 20, it says, um, this is talking about King Neb- Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, and because uh, God, you know, he got saved and God did amazing things. And it, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but it says prior to these verses here that, you know, if he wanted someone executed, they were executed. If he wanted to do this, they did that. He, he had incredible power, Nebuchadnezzar, um, in the kingdom. But it says this, but when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was disposed, disposed of his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him 
and he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was that like the wild donkeys. And, and you know, what happens when we begin to lose the anointing on of our lives, what happens is God, we get disqualified. God dispossesses us in the house. I've seen it time and time again when people go off spiritually or they get resentment or bitterness or criticism. They're all keys to show that there's something very wrong in your life. Uh, what, I, what I see that the Lord has done is he removes their authority in the house. He just takes, takes it off them. And so there's a couple of things. You either repent, you either repent and push back into God to get the anointing back on your life, or you'll pursue secular things. The secular will overflow, will override the spiritual. And, and that's, that's a spirit, that's what happens, and that's where, that's where you begin dwelling with the donkeys, with the wild donkeys. And, um, and what happens is, one of the things we know that when people struggle spiritually, they begin to struggle with the fellowship of the believers. And that's what it said. It says he was driven from the sons of men. And, and that's what happens in the body of Christ. You, you get isolated from the sons of God, the sons and daughters of God. You get isolated from the family of God, isolated from the church, isolated from the house of the Lord, isolated from the bride. This, these are the things that happen. I'm telling you the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Um, he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast. You know, the other thing is that um, what the Lord said, this is really interesting, John twelve forty, and it, it's a quote from Isaiah. He said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should not heal them. And when I was looking at this a little bit this week, and the Lord said to me, when we resist revelation, when we receive, nobody will resist, resist information because information puffs up. Revelation demands a response. When we, when we resist revelation, we harden our hearts. In Hebrews, and that it says to them, don't, don't be like your fathers. Sometimes your fathers, natural, can be leading you in the wrong direction, spiritual. Fathers have an authority in their household. They have an authority over their house. And, the, and, and sometimes what happens if the father in the house goes off, strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep. If the father gets bitter, critical, negative, all of those things begin to happen, the danger is that he leads the family in the same pathway. And so now the spiritual head of the home is leading the kids away from the very essence of God, the, very, the only hope, the only answer to all of our life's problems. Your dad, as a dad, cannot provide what Jesus Christ can provide for you. Our, our humanness, we, our physically, we're so limited, but we need to be a good example, not an example of resistance to the house of God and the will of God, but we need to be an example where we're showing our kids we're full on. Like, where am I gonna be next week on Sunday morning? Here, last week, here, the week before, here, and before, here, 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 here. And the only time in the last four years I've been away, I've either been so sick that I couldn't be here or I've been ministering at another church. Why? Why? Because, it's, see, these, this, is, this is establishing, I want to establish a godly inheritance. I want generations of the righteous. I don't want all my kids and my grandkids and all of that to be feathering around in the world and, and involved in premarital sex and ruining their lives. and wrecking. That's what it's not. It's not about that. So what do you do? You set a standard. It's not religious. It's not religion. It's passion. It's passion driven. You set a standard. And um, um, yeah. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in rebellion. That's from Hebrews chapter 3. And um, yeah, there's just, there's just some things that we need to sort out uh, moving ahead in our lives with God. If you pursue the natural things, you will reproduce natural things. 
and, and the world, look, the truth of it is, our world, we are saturated in the natural things. Absolutely saturated in it. So, so the effort has to come in bringing the spiritual things in. The, the lack, the lack is the spiritual. The lack is the intimacy with God. The lack with those five virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom to arrive was they didn't have enough anointing to sustain them, to get them in to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And so, so I know these are challenging, but who's going to say it to you if I don't say it to you? Because when, you when you get compromised and you're wandering off and doing all sorts of other things, you go around other compromised people. You're not looking to come to see me to have a chat about it. You, you, you're looking for other people that are supporting your lifestyle. You all see birds of a feather, they all flock together. And then what people do, this is what people do, when people get off and they lose their passion for the Lord, they evangelise people into the natural activities. Let's all go here, let's all do this, let's go to a concert, let's go to a nightclub, let's go here, let's go there. They, so the gift of evangelism that meant to be bringing people into the house of the God then gets used to taking people out of the house of God. Let's get you out into the world, into the natural things and saturate you and all of that stuff. So you, we've got to face the real issues because I think something's happening in our world. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced and I, I feel in my spirit, I'm not saying the Lord's coming back tomorrow or next week or even next year, but I do feel in my spirit, we have to be ready. And I fear a lot of us are not ready. I know your lives, I know how most of you live. That's the truth of the matter. And a lot of it is substandard, spiritually, not naturally, spiritually, naturally overflowing, spiritually substandard, spiritually resisting revelation. <laughs> well, well, someone's got to say it, don't we? At some point, if God, if God can't get through, the other thing, um, I always thought, if you know in the millennial reign, it talked about the, I always thought it was the lion lays down with the lamb. And then I, I was reading Isaiah, and I shared this last week, but 11, Isaiah 11, 6 and 7, it says, this is interesting, it says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And um, it's interesting because the other reference in the New Testament between the wolf, the wolves and the sheep, and it talks about wolves in sheep's clothing. And these are in the body of Christ, they're not outside the body of Christ. And they will, listen, they will attract you, invite you, draw you into the natural realms. Oh, you can go to church any old time, but we, this opportunity to go and do this, this is a one-off, we've got to go there. No, it's, you've got to realise what's going on spiritually. See, the times are changing, the whole dimension spiritually of what God is going to be doing on the earth. I think there's been a big change between 23 and 24, and we're, we're all coming up, there's a new level being set by the Lord. The thing is, when the Lord sets a new level, we either reach up and go with it, or we resist it. We say, ah, oh, no, you know, I don't want to change. I don't want to change. I'm happy with my life the way it is. No. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, you don't want me making hay too often, eh? Because there's too many things that get stirred up on my spirit when I'm out there. And um, even like the spirit of laziness, like people, a lot of people are lazy. You know that that's a sin? Anyway, I won't go there. I'm being... I'm trying to be nice. I could, God, bring the nice out. I, um, early this morning, I, I had a lot of things prepared, as you can see, and I actually was wanting to speak about the, the millennial reign of Christ because that's been my main theme. But the Lord, I'm going to talk a little bit about the church now because, and why we exist as a church and, um, and who we are as a church so that you understand um, who we are because... Um, years ago and, and I was praying and really seeking the Lord and, and um, the church was small and I was saying to the Lord, you know, you know, Lord, help us, you know, 
I say to the north, I say to the south, I say to the east, I said, bring them in, you know, bring in the harvest. And, you know, I said, Lord, help us, bring in the harvest, bring in the harvest. Unless the Lord builds the church, we labour in vain. It's not about what we can do, it's about what he can do. So, Lord, Lord, bring them in, bring them in. And the Lord just spoke to me and he said, well, what sort of people do you want? And, and um, it was so clear. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm a natural man. I try to be a spiritual man. That man, I said, oh, big people, small people, fat people, short people, black people, white people, bring them in. I don't care. Bring them in. And the, I missed the point of what God was saying altogether. He said, no, what sort of people do you want? And then I believe this came to me by divine revelation. And it was afterwards that I actually found the scriptures. And the Lord, the Lord I believe he put it in spirit. And what he, the first thing he said what about people who are passionately in love with Jesus? And I just wrote that down. This just is coming. The Holy Spirit speaking. I wrote down, passionately in love with Jesus. Zealous about his works. Zealous. Zealots about his work. Bold in the declaration of their faith. A soul winning people. Great in faith. Mighty in battle. Great in faith. This was all just boom, 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 boom. The Lord just brought it, put, it was just putting it, dropping it into my spirit. And I thought, yeah, this is, this is it. It's, it's not who they are, how big they are, where they come from, what nation. This is, this is the spirit of the house. Acts 1.3. And it says, to whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Do you know the word passion? It's interesting because um, over Easter, they call that passion week. And you know the word passion in the Bible, the Greek word for passion, it actually means sacrifice. So people who are passionately in love, because we, we think it's, oh, I love you, you know, and passion, you know, all of the, the chemistry's there. Um, but... But really, really what the, what the Word of God is talking about, it's, it's when you say passionate in love with Jesus, what you're saying is willing to sacrifice. Because Jesus, the passion of Christ was his sacrifice, his willingness to surrender his whole life for us, to live, to, to, to die for us, to live for us and to die for us. And see, the purpose of that is that we might live for him, that we might be passionate, which means prepared to sacrifice all the other things that surround our life for the purposes of God, for the kingdom of God, the advancement of the kingdom of God. I, 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 these, see, God gives revelation and it's, it's not zealous about his works. Zealous, to be zealous means ardent, ardent, fervor. I like that, earnest or ardent, uh, uh, earnest, ardent, fervor. And then it says this, fanatical devotion. Man, I love that fanatically devoted to Jesus Christ. I love that. Zealous about his works, fanatically devoted. Yes. And then it had, in the, in the meaning, it had missionaries. Yes. Yes, we're on a mission. Oh, I love it. We've got to love him, love his church. And then it says in John 2, 17, and his disciple remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. <laughs> I don't know about you, that gets me excited. The zeal for your house has consumed me. I think it says in the, in the King James, has eaten me up. See, how do you know you're in God? The zeal for his house will eat you up. You won't want to put things in front of it. You won't want to put other stuff in front of the great commission of your divine purpose on the face of the earth. See, that with the ch we have to turn the church upside down because we are, we are way away from the scriptural revelation of what God wants us to be. But I don't know about you. I'm committed to aligning myself with the word of God and the revelation of God. I, 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 you know, I, I don't know if it's... Um, and I know I, I felt actually convicted the other day about stop talking about age, but... I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to rebel right here now this morning. But I don't know if it's an age thing, but you just, you just like everything becomes clearer and the urgency of God's divine plans and purposes for your life and the lives of all of those people that you're going to impact if you're obedient to him. It all becomes so much more real as time goes on. And um, I suppose you do get the sense of, Time's running out, although I, you know, probably 120 years is plenty, but time's running out. There's got to be an urgency in what we do. So we're to be 
passionate or sacrificingly in love with Jesus Christ, zealous about his works. Listen to Titus. This was the verse he actually gave me about good works. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, all right, you should have said, amen, Murray, yeah, awesome, all right. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, looking, anticipating his appearing, his coming, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself for himself, for himself. Listen, his own special people, zealous for good works. Boom. Zealous for good work. That's, that's, that's us. This is who we are. This is who we're meant to be. Revelation 3, 19. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Therefore, be zealous and repent. <laughs> and it's really, it was uh, when Nancy gave me that word a few weeks ago, I shared it with you, you know, and I said, every time I seem to have an encounter with the Lord, I'm behind the woodshed getting a hiding for something. And then she reminded me from Hebrews, you know, the Lord disciplines those he loves. So if you're not getting disciplined, he doesn't love you at all. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad there is a bit of revelation in the house. You've picked up on that false teaching that came there. But anyway, but anyway, you think about it. You think, yeah. Well, you know what happens when you're hard in your heart? When you resist revelation, you don't let it change your life. He stops giving you revelation. When you harden your heart and you begin to resist the Spirit of the Lord over a period of time, He stops coming. One of the things he does is he, he, you know, we always think, you know, like I think was it David that prayed the heavens were like brass, you know, where are you God? The heavens are like brass. Well, God never moves away from us, but we move away from him. Oh, I want to smack some things. And then we were to be bold in the declaration of our faith. Bold means to be fearless, confident and adventurous. I like that, adventurous. And in it, in it, the whole of our spiritual life is an adventure with God. Proverbs 28, 1. The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are bold as lions. <laughs> That's awesome, eh? I loved it when our league, our league club was called the Lions. And our Lions sport, the righteous are as bold as lions. Because the purpose of the league club wasn't league. That was the, that was, that was, the purpose was evangelism. And there's a lot of people in the church today because of that evangelism. The, the purpose wasn't league, it was evangelism. And that's, that's why whatever we're doing, you know, is, we've got to keep that focus. Um, the pur purpose of the basketball is not basketball. It's not being consumed with basketball. It's, it's being consumed with Jesus and getting in contact with people where you can share your faith. Business is not about just making money and working hard in business so that you can buy all the new toys. It's an opportunity to be in contact with people to share your faith. Um, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, but even after we'd suffered, we were shamefully treated at Philippi. This is, this is the disciples. He says, even after all of that, we were shamefully treated. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God. Isn't it interesting? I think it was Paul that asked the church to pray that he had boldness. The um, musicians can actually come while I'm winding up here because I, I feel I've done enough damage for one day. <laughs> Acts 4.13 says this, And now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them, listen to this, that they had been with Jesus. I love that because I think I fit into unlearned and ignorant quite comfortably. You know, that's kind of, that's my background. But I hope that they, I hope that they took knowledge, they take knowledge of me that I'd been with Jesus. I hope that for every one of our lives. I hope that people will see something different. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, and I, I, 
you know, when's this going to happen at our prayer meeting? Why not at one of these prayer meetings? The ladies' one is the next big one out at the campsite. This might be the event. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. With boldness. 2 Corinthians 3.12, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. And um, I could go on, there's a lot more here. I have pages and reams of stuff, but I think that I've shared enough. But I'm going to share a little bit more um, on the church and on the, the reason for this church's existence. And you might be sitting there today and say, oh, this is too much for me. You, it's kind of amazing over the years. I've had a lot of people leave the church. They say, oh, um, you know, the church is, the, you ask for too high a commitment. Now, I can never understand that. Oh, I'm going to go to a little church down the road because I can just sit there and learn and do nothing. The chariot of God will ride through to go right past that stop over to... Anyway, <laughs> but I, I had an answer. It's probably one of a smart answer because I'm a, I, I have, sometimes I get a smart answer. My answer is, is, you're struggling about a high commitment church when we have a total commitment God. I don't know about you. That doesn't make sense to me. It sort of goes like, eh, eh. what's wrong with you? Not to what, what's wrong with the challenge of the church to a, to a high commitment of the things of God. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you that you won't surrender your life to that level? No wonder you... <laughs> No wonder the miraculous and all the other goody stuff that God has for us is not functioning and flowing. No wonder you're not growing. You know, people, people stop in their, in their walk with God. And it's, it's, you know what splits churches? Two, two things split churches. Um, uh, revelation is the greatest divider of the church worldwide since time began. That's why there's thousands of different churches. And they all split over, a very, over various revelation over a doctrine, over a, over a belief. And um, so uh, revelation is it can be dividing, it can be dividing because it, it, people struggle with it. And um, the other one is, I've forgotten. The other one is actually resisting revelation, I think. When you're in a church and the revelation of the house gets beyond where you're prepared to live, you, you'll leave. And that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Some people sometimes need to leave. Now I'm preaching exiting the church. <laughs> because if you're miserable, critical, grumpy, you don't want to be here, dragging yourself to turn up, reluctant, you're just an anchor. You're just an anchor. You might as well go put one of those big lead belts around your waist and go diving. You're just an anchor. <laughs> No, listen to me. Listen to my heart and what I'm saying. <laughs> the reason God's turning up with the young, the young people and the youth is because they're turning up for God and God is turning up for them. If you want God to turn up for you, you've got to turn up for God. That's, that's it. That's it. Total, total commitment. Absolute surrender. Whole, your whole life, all your future. All your past, all your problems, all your struggles, all your, you know, all your sin and all that, you dump all of that down on that altar. The old Nazarene church, we used to have a wooden altar at the front of the church. And when we had an altar call, it was an altar call. You'd come up to the altar, you'd kneel down on your altar. And um, we, we prayed a prayer in the Nazarene church all the time. And, the, and uh, when we got to the altar, it was putting everything on the altar. And we'd say, Lord, I give you all my sin and all my battles and all my weaknesses and all my struggle. I give you my wife. I give you my children. I give you my family. I give you my money. I give you my work. I give you my friends. I put it all on the altar. Everything, Lord, I just put it all to struggle. Everything you've given me, Lord, all the gifts, I give you the gifts. I, all the past, there's a lot of mess back there. I give you all the past, all the future. I give you my time. I give you my finances. and I just give you all my future. That was, that was what the old, that's what we did at the altar. It was, a place, it was a place of full surrender, a place of total commitment. And um, I had powerful encounters at those altars, on my knees at the altars. I remember when the caller, when I was only, a, I was a baby Christian, I was less than, less than a year old when the call of God came into my life. 
And I still I remember the song. They were singing it at the end of the service. They were singing a hymn. You'll, you'll probably know the hymn if you've been around the church for 100 years. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. Da, 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 da. They're looking for Helmore to pick up. I'll be what you want me to be, dear Lord. And we always held that note. No? <laughs> but um, when, we would, when we just, you know, sometimes the worship, if it's an anointed song, I'll go where you want me to go. It was the call of God was coming on my life. I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist it. My heart was beating. Everything in my life was just, everything just came alive and dramatic. And I, I remember I just started sobbing. We just, I just started weeping because the call of God. I'd come to him just a few months before and now, now, now something, there's this transaction taking place in my life I didn't fully understand but all I knew was that he just wanted all of me. And I want to tell you the truth, I wanted all of him. I'd had enough of the world, I'd, you know, and the drugs and everything. I'd had enough of all of that. And when he came into my life, I just wanted him. And when that call came, do you realise realize that Jesus said in his word, you did not choose me, I chose you. You realise that? You realise that you, you've been, you, we are chosen by God. I believe God orchestrates um, at the circumstances of our life to give us an opportunity to respond absolutely and totally to him. And that's why Jesus said, you didn't choose me. It wasn't your idea. I chose you. And, and, then, and, and when he chooses you, it's like the team at school. You know, you, you, you. I was always the last one. But anyway, um, not in Christ. I chose you. I chose you to live for me. And I'll tell you what, that transcends. Something happens in your heart. You think, yeah, that's all I want. That's all I want. I, all I want is him. I can, sounds, I'm going to be real naughty now. I can live without all of you, but I can't live without him. I can't live without him. If he, if he leaves, if he left my life, or the Holy Spirit left my life, I'm left with nothing. I'm just a broken down human being. I'm left with nothing. We've got to have him. You've got to have him. He, everything is in him. And... Um, I, I feel too, um, I've been challenged and Nancy's been talking about this for years and we've talked about a lot together, but um, I think I'm, I'm going to start a Bible college. I think I'm gonna, we're going to start a Bible school, a training centre, an Acts 29, an activation centre. And um, part of it has come from a response. I've, we've had a lot of people, Nancy's had several. I've had quite a number of people coming up to me recently and saying, oh, I'm really interested in Bible school. I'm interested in ministry. I want to go on. And you know, You've got to have the Holy Ghost. You've got to have the Holy Ghost thing. But the call of God is going out to people I know. And that's why this appetite and this desire to train and be equipped for ministry. That's why the desire's there. And so um, we're going to see how we can put it together and, and do something that would be really life-changing. We, we, years ago, we ran Acts 29 schools and we ran them throughout New Zealand. And then we went to Australia and then we took them over into America. And I still have people today that I meet around and it's like, that was early 90s, mid 90s through there. I meet people today and say, oh, I went to Acts 29. My whole life was changed. And um, so anyway, I, I think we, we just got to do it. We got to respond to the Spirit, um, to what the Holy Spirit's saying in these days. And, you know, whether it's a day school and a night school, because some might be able to come in the day, some at night, I don't know, we'll do something. We're going to do something. We're going to lay hands. We'll bring people in. We're going to pray. All right. Um, let's have our song. You've got our older call song. And um, what we're going to do this morning, I, I still want people, if you're here and you're visiting, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, look, um, you, need, you, need, you need to know Him. You need to come to God. First step, you need to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never, there's nothing else. Once, once you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, everything else will open up. The revelation, the understanding, all of the rest of the stuff, all of the questions that you have, they all begin to open up and answers begin to come instantly. It's the first step. You were created by God. Um, he, wants you, you, he wants you to be a part of His family, to be walking with Him in relationship with Him. And um, it's, a, it's a real key. It's the first step. 
So if that's you and you're visiting this morning, you might be traveling along. And I just want to encourage you that we're going to sing a song and invite people to come to the front. And uh, if you want to meet God, you've got to do it publicly. I'll tell you, that's part of it. Uh, you confess Him before man, He confesses you. Jesus confesses you before God in heaven. But I also feel this morning there's a lot of people here that um, the call of God, there's been something going on in your life and you feel like the call of God, God is reaching out to you and, um, and that you, you're coming to that point now in your life where you're prepared to give everything over. It's going to mean a lot of things. It could be a career change, direction change, but um, you're at that point where you're ready to just hand it all over to the Lord and allow God to use you for the rest of your life to expend all of your life to advance the kingdom of God, the purposes of God. It, it's, it's, it sounds like you're giving a lot up. You're not. <laughs> you, you, never, you never get shortchanged when you come with God. The, the things that God can do with a life are incredible. Um, just amazing. So let's stand together. And we're going to sing it nice and bold, of course, and not too slow. Nice and fast and firm. A little bit faster than that. We keep dragging things a bit. Come on. Every burden, every crown. This is my Come surrender. On this is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room for you. one more time just keep playing back there we're going to sing this through one more time and uh, you know we're not going to prolong things but if the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you this morning and the call of God come in on your life or you don't know him and you need to surrender this is this is at the start of 24 now's the day this is the time <clears throat> you'll never get a better opportunity than this the power of God is really here and uh, I just feel the, the Holy Spirit drawing people and, um, you know, he's calling out, he's choosing people this morning for his divine call, his divine purposes, his plans for you. And um, don't resist the Lord. Don't, don't get stuck with pride and stubbornness and resist the Lord. It's time to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and let God um, exalt you. And it's good that the doors are closed because everybody should be coming forward. No, I see people start running for the doors, but 
That's the wrong direction. Let me warn you as a pastor, you're heading in the wrong direction. (laughs) The right direction is total surrender, absolute surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ and the divine call and the purposes of God in your life. That's it. That's it. All right, we're going to sing this again. Just come. Just come as we sing. You know, sometimes when the call of God comes, you think I'm too old or I'm too young or I don't know anything or I don't think I have too many gifts or anything like this. How could God use me? You know, it's interesting in the Word of God, He covers a lot of these things. He says that He calls the weak and despised things of this world to confound the wise. Um, he, he's not looking for great talent or great intellect or great wisdom or anything like that. He's looking for a great heart that's willing to surrender to Him and allow Him to use them. That's what He's looking for. He can give you the gifts and the abilities that you need to do the task that He's got set before you. He, can, he will equip you. You'll be equipped by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, it's just, just, we just bring what we've got and we lay it down before Him and He adds to it, you know. He, he does the big part. We bring the little part. <laughs> so um, I just believe that there's going to be a real divine transaction taking place in people's hearts here, the, here this morning. And just if you've come forward and you've never given your life to the Lord, just put your hand up so I can see. We'd love to pray with you. Good on you, man. Awesome. Some others here that, uh, yeah, over there. Anybody else? I'll just I'll look over the right, this is your left-hand side. Anybody else? You're coming first time you're giving your life to the Lord. Oh yeah, I see over there, there's several over there, that's great. All right, let's, let's uh, pray for these guys first and then I want to pray for the call of God. So uh, let's pray out together, let's pray, pray out loud and make our declaration of faith. Dear Lord Jesus, this morning I come to surrender my life totally to you. And right now, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin, all the things that I have done that offended you, offended other people and offended even myself. And right now, Lord Jesus, 
I desire to surrender my life completely and totally over to you. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would take control of my life this morning. I resist the enemy. I resist Satan, all of his plans, all of his works, everything he has to offer in this world. I resist in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And this morning, Lord Jesus, I just surrender completely to you. And I pray this in your mighty, mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Give them a hand and a blessing because that's awesome. That's an awesome decision. That's a really awesome decision. Now, I want to I pray for you guys that are sensing a call of God on your life. And, you know, I just feel this is a, just strings, thanks, Deb. I just feel that this is actually quite a holy moment that there's a, I kind of feel like almost like a hush in the spirit realm, in the, in the spirit, as God is just going to do a transaction in people's lives. And it's really about just yielding it all. It's, it's, it's really from this point on, you're going to remove all the obstacles out of your life from serving God. And I believe God will anoint you with a boldness. He'll, he'll begin to unfold things around your life. The, the, Bible, the Bible school that we're going to start could be something that will really, really interest you. And um, you're going to have to make an investment in your future, you know, with your time and everything like that for the Lord. But there's a transaction. It starts with you guys because you've got a heart like David. See, the Lord said to David, I found a man that had a heart after me, a heart like my heart. And that's, that's what you're like. You have that David's heart. So right now, Lord, I just pray for each and every one, Lord, that's wanting to surrender their life into your ministry, into your calling, into your divine purpose for their life. I pray now, Lord, that you would accept the offering of themselves, of their past, of their life, of their sin, of their talents, of their gifts and of their future, of all their resources. Lord, I ask now that they would lay it all down at your altar and at your feet. Every part of their existence, every part of their life, their family, their friends, their children, the the extended family, every part, Lord, we just yield it over now. Like the Nazarenes, Lord, we put it all down on that altar. We lay it all at your feet. And now, Lord, in faith, we pick up that call and that destiny that you have for us this morning. And we just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we know we're chosen. We know that you've chosen us for your divine purposes. We thank you for that, Lord, and we respond to your call. In Jesus' mighty name, I just want to, Holy Spirit, ask now that you begin to touch each and every one, that you begin to shift them, both in the natural and in the spiritual. I ask, Lord, that there be an impartation of your Holy Spirit that will just begin to come and touch each and every one. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just move amongst these, your called out ones, the ones, Lord, that you are choosing at this time. Father, I pray that that fresh anointing would come a fresh hunger for the things of the Spirit will just come into each heart and in each spirit in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I ask now that there'll be supernatural manifestations of your power and of your might through these lives. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll begin to activate your ministry through them Right, from this moment on, from this moment forth, I pray for boldness to declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, for the strength to maybe shift and make career choices and different decisions in their life that are going to be strategic to the fulfilment of the call that is on these lives. And so, Father, I just thank you right now. I know, Holy Spirit, that you're gathering these up in your arms for your divine purposes in these times. And I thank you for that. And I give you praise and glory and blessing in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen and amen and amen and amen. And Hey, can I encourage you to shake a hand, give one another a hug and a blessing and a, an encouragement. And, and we're going to close with uh, come, come Jesus, come a little bit faster. Not <laughs> I, want, I want us to sing in closing, come Jesus, come. It's a, it's a song about the second coming of Jesus Christ and it's very relevant to where we're at today. Hey, just one other thing before people spread out too much. Um, We've got the last bit of hay out there out at the uh, campsite to gather in. 
if there were three or four guys that had a couple of hours this afternoon, say from two o'clock, uh, that might be able to help us out there just to bail up. We got pretty much most of it in. There's just probably about 100 bales left. Um, that'd be fantastic. And thanks, that we had a whole team of guys out yesterday. It was fantastic, really appreciate that. And Neil and Jeff have been working day and night, those guys, but hey, shake one of those hands, give a blessing. Let's start that music and we'll close with this awesome song, amen. Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray. Come, Jesus, come. Let today be the day. Sometimes I feel like I'm gone.
Come on, come on, come on. Come on, praise him, praise him, praise him. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, exalt him, exalt him, exalt him. Amen. Woo! Yes! Yes, 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 yes. Yes! Yes, 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 yes. Come on! Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. There's a transaction taking place. There's a spiritual transaction taking place. Come on, come on. Just push in, push in a little bit more. Sometimes you've got to push in a little bit harder and lay hold. Lay hold of what the Lord has for you. You've got to fight for your destiny. Fight for your future. Fight for your family. Fight for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fight for souls. We're fighting for souls. We want revival. Nothing else will satisfy us. Nothing short of revival, Lord. Nothing short of revival. Let it come, Lord. Let it come. Amen, amen, and amen. And Jesus, we're just getting started, actually, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> amen. Thank you, Lord. Hey, we'll have a fabulous week. Stay fired up with God, spend time with Him, and uh, come next week fully cranked up in the things of the Lord. Radical, fanatical believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, holding nothing back. Cast aside all the worldly activity, all of that pleasurable stuff. Re, redirect the pro, reprioritize your life. Come on, and uh, let's really push into God because He's going to push into us. Amen.